We're going to have a great talk today. Alan Borning has been here longer than me. <laughs> Alan was our first HCI hire in the department in 1980. Sure it is. <laughs> and <laughs> and uh, Alan, Alan and uh, Travis, who is uh, working with Alan on the, the problems you'll hear about today. Uh, Travis is a graduate student who's going to be finishing up this December and will be continuing on as a postdoc here in the department, at least for the immediate future. future. And uh, they're going to talk about some really, uh, I think, profound and potentially very positive technology that uh, should have a great effect on our public discourse. And really excited about this work, and I think you will too. And I'm going to give it to them and let you tell, tell you all about it. Okay, thanks Gaetano for that really nice introduction. So we'd like to talk to you about supporting reflective public thought. Um, we want to share some work, as Gaetano said, uh, that we've been doing in civic engagement in politics. Um, one uh, purpose is to just talk about the research. Another is to uh, see if we can find some new collaborators for this work. And finally, to point people to the Living Voters Guide, which is a resource, a citizen-generated guide for the measures in the Washington uh, November election coming up. And then we, we're going to leave time at the end for uh, discussion and, and, and questions so we can have a conversation about how to move forward in this area. So our institutions are failing at the moment. Uh, politics is deadlocked. Uh, decision makers and the public as well are polarized. If we look at the statistics, trust in government and uh, approval of uh, Congress is at uh, nearly record lows. So this is not a good situation given the magnitude of the problems we've got in uh, the nation in the world. If we look back into history, uh, Franklin Roosevelt in uh, an address at Oglethorpe College in 1932 said, the country needs, and I lessen mis unless I mistake its temper, the country demands bold, persistent experimentation. It's only common sense to, try a me to take a method and try it. If it fails, frankly admit it and move on and try another. But above all, try something. So what we want to do is experiment with political systems and uh, communication as well. Ellen, let's not be overly nostalgic here. I mean, okay. there's, you know, the system might be broke, but uh, there's a lot of energy out there to try to fix things. Uh, and we have new tools at our disposal. We have this vast world, this web, where we can come together and connect and share ideas and build, come together and build wonders like Wikipedia. <clears throat> Maybe we can find some way in here to experiment and figure out a good way forward. But if we look down here into the political realm, uh, the, the blogs, the Seattle Times comment section, here we've got um, you know, 461 comments. It's where insights and opinions go to die. <laughs> Furthermore, uh, the uh, place isn't always that inviting. I think we've got troubles. Well, that might be true, but, and, and what I hear you saying is that the web really doesn't channel this energy yet very well. I couldn't have said that better well, myself. All right, but, you know, I, I don't think that's inevitable. I, I, I think that we can design interfaces that better channel this energy, that nudge people towards uh, more constructive interaction. That's the, that's the potential of, uh, of computer interfaces. As the first hire in CSE, I would have thought that you would have known that, that, that <laughs> okay, when, okay. when we can... <laughs> When we design interfaces, we can really shape behavior. And in particular, I think that what we want to try to do is to encourage more reflective behaviors uh, in our discussions. And by reflection here, I mean a couple things. I mean mindful introspection of trying to better understand what we ourselves believe. I mean empathetic listening, trying to understand the perspectives that other people are coming from. And also considering some of the trade-offs that are inherent in the decisions that we're trying to make. So if we look at these, uh, we see that, in fact, these are specific behaviors, but they're in support of deliberative values. Uh, so underlying what we're interested in doing is uh, a, a very normative stance that we're interested in deliberation in the civic context. There are other values that are well that are important here, and then we'll bring them up as we go through the demo and the, the results. So, what we're going to do now is talk about the Living Voters Guide, a citizen-generated guide to measures on the, both the November 2010 and 2000 election 
Uh, and it's based, uh, it's, it's built using a uh, open source platform called Considerate, and we'll talk about both of these. And then uh, Travis is going to talk about a second system, Reflect, that shares many of the goals, although the way it does so is quite different. Okay, so let's look at the, uh, the Living Voters Guide. Um, in uh, our uh, work here, we collaborated with uh, folks from uh, political science and communication, in particular uh, the Center for Communication and Civic Engagement, and then also Seattle City Club, which is a really wonderful, uh, forward-looking civic organization uh, here in Washington State. In 2010, uh, the Living Voters Guide uh, encompassed the, uh, the nine statewide measures, uh, the initiatives and the referenda. In 2011, we've got uh, three initiatives, uh, a couple of uh, refer constitutional amendments, and then in addition, we have all of the regional and local measures in the state, so 125 total, ranging from the uh, Seattle Transportation Benefit District, uh, car tab tax to support uh, transportation, to a controversial charter amendment in Spokane, to two different mosquito district measures in Watertown, and more cemetery district levies than you could carve onto a tombstone. Before we dive into what we saw during the Living Voters Guide, I'm gonna uh, try to convey to you the underlying ideas behind the considerate platform. In order to do this, I'm going to uh, step through how the system works using one of the most pressing problems of our time as a guide. And that is whether CSC should officially support Macintoshes. <laughs> so let's say that we're trying to understand this issue and have a discussion, a frank discussion as, uh, as students, as staff, as faculty here in the computer science department. So what Consider it does is it really centralizes pros and cons. So you will come in and create a pro and a con list, okay? A personal pro and con list. It's something that everyone is familiar with. The affordance of the pro and con list is also that it calls attention to an imbalanced list. So if you've got all pros and you're not thinking about the cons, that'll at least come to your attention. So it may nudge people towards considering trade-offs. But we live in the social media world, and so we want to have something a little social here. So the twist on the typical pro-con uh, list is that in the margins are included um, all of the different pros and cons that other people have contributed. So, um, and you're able to include those uh, pros and cons into your list, okay? So essentially what we're doing is we're focusing people on thinking through the issue and optionally being able to draw on the thoughts that other people have already contributed. So not only might you get an insight into, uh, into some different aspects of the, um, of the issue that you hadn't thought about yet, but you might also learn a little bit about some of the muddied interests at play. So the second part of, um, of Consider It is that you're able to not only show the pros and cons that, that you find to be most uh, uh, important, but you're able to also take a stance on a continuous spectrum from support to oppose uh, to indicate your um, position on this issue. <clears throat> and we try to do that on a slider as opposed to a yes, no to kind of break down some of the typical uh, binary ways of expressing ourselves that we typically use in, a, in our political system. So these are the inputs to consider it. Um, with this information, we're able to expose and lift to the surface the most important pros and cons of the, of the issue that are resonating with, with the people. Okay? Um, and this is what provides in the Living Voters Guide, this is essentially the Voters Guide, the most important pros and cons. Okay? Um, but recall that we, we, we have this information about what are the most important pros and cons, but also the people who are saying what those important pros and cons are are also giving a stance on the issue. So we're able to facilitate an, um, an interesting way of drilling down into the positions that other people think about. So let's say that, that you know, let's say I'm just, I'm just against um, supporting Macintoshes for CSE. It's just, I just, I just don't see why you would ever want to support it. Well, I can at least let the, the people who support it um, put out their best uh, thoughts forward. So here you're able to actually probe down into the, um, the pros and the cons that those people who supported it found most important. And you'll notice that there are also people who are supporting this that recognize some of the cons. And this is something that we don't see typically in our political discussion. And that is people who are strongly opposing or strongly supporting something 
actually recognizing a trade-off. In our media environment, we typically see um, strong advocates coming head-to-head -head and not compromising on anything. So we think that this provides some facility for finding common ground. So that's the basics behind, uh, behind Consider it. And um, insert joke here about live demoing, but I'm going to do it. So here's the homepage for Living Voters Guide. As Alan said, uh, uh, it's up and running. We'd love it if you guys uh, shared it with your family and friends and came and used it yourselves. Um, there are, here you can see that there's five state measures. <coughs> and you can also enter your own zip code here. And it's going to then reveal um, the ones in, for me in Seattle. Uh, so here's two of the, of the Seattle ones. And the rest of the state ones are down here. Now, as you might imagine, how many of you have seen uh, uh, 1183? Uh, okay, so this is, this is the privatizing liquor. This is the one that's driving nearly all the traffic. This is where all the attention is in this election, it appears. Um, or, well, maybe not all, but a lot of it. So let's go in. Let's say that we're trying to uh, make our decision about this one. So here we can see at the top, we have a description of the issue, although I guess you guys can't really see. It's kind of small. Um, and you can kind of drill down into more information. This stuff is coming from the, the voters' pamphlet. Um, and then, as you might imagine from the earlier slides, you can take your stance on this uh, as you will. So let's just say I oppose this or something. Um, here are the pros and cons. Uh, these are all things that people already have added in there. I haven't changed these or anything. Um, so basically, uh, you can drag and drop these as you see fit if you want to include them in your list. <clears throat> Moreover, you're able to go in here and see some details about what they had wrote. So they can write a, a short nutshell description, summary of their point, and then more details. This person didn't add much. Um, and they can add links if they want. And you can see that you can also have a discussion. So a bunch of people have been talking about this. You can go in and add your own comment as well. So while we don't put people in direct um, discussion in the top level interface, you can drill down into these points and have discussions about them. <clears throat> OK, and of course, you can add your own. And this is you know, 140 character delimited. I'm not going to add that in there, um, as intelligent as that may be. Um, you can link to external websites if you would like. Uh, the gray is a little hard to see here. Um, and there's this little box down here that's, uh, that says, hide your name from other users. Um, and this is attempting to uh, rectify um, accountability for speech. So, um, well, what well, do you yeah, want to so, say? So there's an interesting value tension here. On the one hand, we, we want to support the value of accountability, where you stand behind what you say and, in, and you sign it. And on the other hand, there's a tension with the value of privacy and a kind of um, political safety where, uh, particularly if you're a well-known person, you may not want your name out there and to get flamed about something. So what, the way we, we uh, balance this is that we allow anonymous comments, but uh, we you know, put this little note saying, are you sure you want to do this? And then we also make it uh, marked as anonymous rather than you know, Red Baron or some pseudonym. So again, okay. there's you know, multiple values and there's a tension. And here's how we're resolving it in this interface. OK, so th this, is, this is pretty much the extent of, of, of this interface. There are some, some other design decisions that we're not going to go into here. Um, so let's say these, uh, after you've gone through this pro-con creation uh, process, you're able to um, uh, update your stance if it's changed. And you can also subscribe to new points to this position, et cetera, so you can stay informed about what's happening. And you go in and save, and this is where, uh, again, you see this breakdown of support for the issue. So most people participating um, are uh, in favor of 1183. And you can see that these are the most important pros and cons for people. And you can uh, move through them. And if you click on one of these, you'll see the, the most important uh, pros and cons for this group of people or for this group of people. Now, I want to I talk a little bit about how these are ranked. It's not just the number of times that people include a point that we, that we count that as, as having a higher ranking. We also incorporate um, uh, a notion of uh, the fraction of the time that we show a point to someone or the number of unique people that we've shown it to versus the number of times that's been included. This is kind of like a batting average. Um, and it's, it's meant to help counteract some of the rich get richer preferential attachment sort of dynamics that you typically have in 
asynchronous voting systems where the um, points that are added earlier in the system may accrue more inclusion simply by being shown to more people. And we want to try to avoid that. We also rank higher points that are included by people from across the spectrum. So if, if a point is included by both someone who opposes it and also supports it, we raise it in its ranking. And we use an entropy calculation for that. All right, so that's the, um, those are the, that's the living voter's guide and consider it how it works. Are there any, are there any questions right now just of the mechanics of this? Okay. Oh. Are similarly worded word things grouped together in any way? No. And Alan will bring that up at the end. This is a, a direction for future work. Um, you know, we could, for example, if we knew, if we had that kind of clustering, we'd be able to um, better serve diversity of points as opposed to showing the same types of points. So that's a good direction to go. You, I mean, you've clearly designed this for democratic political discourse. But I mean, mechanically, it, there's nothing unique to that as opposed to decision making mm -hmm. for any sort of binary or even continuous outcome. So, I, absolutely, we we see this as potentially a general purpose deliberation tool. So, um, all right, are there any more mechanical? Uh, so I would consider that actually a little bit higher level. Um, it's all right. Oh, it's it's fine. It's fine. It's all right. You know, we're we're cool with what just happened. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not sure where the boundary is between consider it and the voter's guide. Um, okay, well, this is a good question. Um, if, you would, if you would simply replace the ballot measures with like issues confronting CSE, you could imagine having the exact same system going on, right? So um, consi the Living Voters Guide is essentially just the, the types or the specific issues that we're considering, which are the ballot measures. Um, so the, you know, but you can see that with other things. Now, that's not saying that the system as it's currently designed is best suited, or um, the system maybe have to be redesigned for other kinds of decision making, making circumstances. Um, so and we'll we'll talk about how we plan to generalize it at the end. All right, I'm gonna I'm gonna move on move on now and talk about some of the results that we saw in the 2010 election. <clears throat> so I'm first gonna kind of give some high level overall trends just to get a sense of what happened. And then I'm gonna, I'm gonna drill down into some of the uh, measures that we have for reflective activity, which were our main design goals after all. <clears throat> so what happened? Well, we, we got about 9,000 unique visitors to the site. And we saw that increasing near, near the election. And we launched on, so it, it, was, it was out for about five weeks uh, before the election. Uh, we had about 500 registered users. And you can see that there, um, the registrations occurred more uh, towards the beginning. So the people who wanted to contribute um, tended to come earlier, and then people who wanted to consume the information tended to come, come later. So that was a general trend. That we're going to see that coming up uh, uh, later. We also, you can see these spikes. That was media. Um, so we had uh, Seattle Times article, Cairo piece, UW Daily. And these were some of the main drivers of, of, uh, of traffic to our site. One of the most encouraging uh, aspects of the 2010 election was that we had over five and a half minutes average time on site. And if we uh, exclude the bounce visits, so where people came to the homepage and left after five seconds, uh, we had over 10 minutes average time on site. And this is pretty encouraging, particularly for a civically oriented uh, technology, because oftentimes people don't really spend much time doing that. So, uh, to kind of cap the uh, usage, <clears throat> we got 10,000 visitors, which is not nearly enough to shape an election. But if we did get people to come, they tended to stick around. So we, we find this to be encouraging. <clears throat> okay, moving on to some of the actual activ some of the contributions on the site. We had uh, 360 points distributed across the nine statewide ballot measures. <laughs> And those were contributed early on, once again, as people were fleshing out some of the pros and cons. And the inclusions, on the other hand, the inclusions of the points into people's lists were distributed later on in time. So again, this is a producer-consumer relationship. And the same thing occurred with the number of positions submitted. So uh, position being your pro and con list and your stance on it. OK, so those were the, the high-level trends that we saw.
uh, but they don't really get at the, uh, at the question of whether we succeeded in our design goals. So recall that we wanted to try to encourage reflective thought. And getting at that is kind of difficult, but we came up with some metrics for trying to um, understand the extent to which we were successful. So the first, uh, the first class of uh, reflective behaviors that we're interested in looking at were whether people explicitly consider, explicitly consider trade-offs. And the second one is whether they engaged opposing viewpoints. <clears throat> so stepping into the first one, considering trade-offs, <clears throat> Our most definitive evidence for whether someone considered trade-offs is whether they included both a pro and a con into their list. Okay, so that's an explicit, that's explicit evidence that they're recognizing the importance of, uh, of uh, both uh, of pros and cons. Um, <clears throat> so in other words, this list uh, that has all pros is not an example. On the other hand, uh, this one with two pros and one con is a positive example of considering trade-offs. <clears throat> so what did we see? Well, if we look at the fraction of the positions that were submitted that included uh, at least one in, that, that had at least one inclusion, we saw that 41.4% uh, of these positions included at least one pro and one con. Now, of course, if you only included one point, you can never include a pro and a con. Um, so if we bump up the, if, if we constrain our data a little bit more, we get over 50%. Including points is a, is a kind of a, a lower bound on whether people consider trade-offs. Because it might be that you consider some of the trade-offs, but none of them really resonated with you. So another way that we can look at this is whether people uh, try to read both pros and cons. So this one's a little more liberal of a measure. And what we're going to look at here is a couple ways of measuring this. We don't have any direct way of measuring whether someone read a point or not. Um, is whether they uh, clicked, if they requested to hear more, to read more about a point. So if I took a, if, if I included you know, a pro and I also clicked uh, read more and I con, that's some kind of indication that I was considering trade-offs. So what do we see here? For those positions where someone expanded at least one point, uh, we saw that they expanded a pro and a con in nearly 40% of the cases. So our second way of looking at uh, whether they read both pros and cons is whether they requested to see more of them. So remember that we have multiple, um, we have more than four pros and cons in most cases and we could paginate on them. So if people requested to see more pros and cons, then we can suggest, we can infer that they were interested in reading both sides. So in this case, uh, for people who paginated, uh, we saw that they asked for either side uh, in 68.2% of the cases. This doesn't necessarily mean that they read them, right? They can just be scrolling through it, but it's an indicator. <clears throat> okay, so those are the, the first class of uh, measures that we have, uh, particularly for the considering trade-offs. <clears throat> Second one is whether they engaged opposing views. Now you might be thinking, well, aren't those the same things? But th they're not. You can be considering trade-offs. You can be considering both pros and cons, but they don't necessarily have to um, uh, uh, cross ideological boundaries. So for example, if you were thinking about whether to bail out General Motors, okay, there are both uh, pros and cons from a conservative perspective as well as from a liberal perspective. You may have considered both pros and cons but have not crossed those boundaries. So in our system, we know the position, the stance that someone took, as well as the stance of the person who wrote a point. So we're able to see whether people were including points that were written by people who took an opposite stance than they did. Okay, so for example, <coughs> in this case, you can note that I'm opposing this is, or I'm opposing 1183, but I've included this pro point. And if this pro point was written by someone who took a, who was supporting the issue, we can say that they were engaging the, uh, uh, the opposing viewpoint. So again, <coughs> uh, looking at the positions that included at least one point, 33.7% of them included a point that was written by a user who took an opposing view. You can guess what's coming next whether people were reading points 
uh, put forth by uh, someone with an opposing view. <clears throat> and for this one, I'm just going to go through uh, the point expansions that we already saw. So if someone uh, <coughs> clicked to see if they, to read more about a point that was written by someone who took an opposite stance than they did, and in this one, we saw that 56.4% uh, of the cases where someone expanded a point, they were expanding it about uh, uh, one that was written by someone who took an opposing view. Okay, you guys are probably sick of those kind of metrics now. So I'm, d I'm done with them for now. So this is kind of a summary. Um, these are our core, core metrics to determine whether what, what we saw. And we, we think that uh, people have seem to use the reflective mechanisms of consider it to, a, to a, an encouraging extent. Now what we have not done is to show a causal relationship between the interface mechanisms and the actual activities being uh, taking place. Um, and this is, this is future work. However, I want to call attention to the fact that a naturalistic experiment ha is, is powerful for other reasons. Uh, many times these civic platforms are designed in such a way that they have this utopian vision of how people should uh, relate to one another. They, they design it, maybe they do controlled experiments and show that you know, it would have a positive effect, and then they put it out there and it's never used. Um, so what we wanted to do first was to show that, to test out, to figure out if people actually wanted to use this type of, or would actually be able to use this type of uh, uh, system, and if so, then, then we'd be able to push forward on some of the, to understanding the specific uh, uh, effects of some of the interface choices. <clears throat> so that's, that's considerate. We have other results. Uh, we have a paper coming out. I'd be happy to share it with you if you want to know more. Um, but I'm not going to talk about any of the additional uh, analyses we've done about what happened during the Living Voters Guide. So. At this point, I want to switch over and talk about this other system called Reflect, which shares a lot of the same uh, principles behind Considerate in trying to foster more constructive dialogue. <clears throat> so Reflect is premised on an observation about the maturity of the web. Uh, it really is only 2.0 years old. And qu it's quite accurate. And it's getting social. It's getting good at speaking, but it's not really good at listening yet. Uh, so when I say this, I mean that our interfaces for communicating tend to be designed to speak into rather than to listen through. And it's important to note that speaking is not or listening is not just passively hearing. It's about listeners giving evidence that they are understanding the speaker. And these acts of listening help speakers. They, they help them understand if their point is getting across. It helps them know that they're being recognized and heard. Moreover, it helps, it helps, it helps the listeners. Listening actively actually can, has power in discussions. It can help steer the conversation in certain ways. And it shows that you're a good faith participant in the discussion. Now, it's, but it's not just important for the speakers and listeners. It's important for other people who are present. So, for example, uh, if someone, if someone hears uh, someone listening productively, they might be able to better understand what someone else was trying to say. So <clears throat> um, you've probably all seen this. We're in a, in a giant meeting with a lot of people, and someone says something very complicated, and then someone else raises their hand and says, are you trying to say this? And they say it very succinctly, very cleanly. Everyone else better understands, and everyone's like, ah, we understand what you're trying to say. That's what we want to try to do on the web. Um, do, that, do more of that. Um, so Reflect is a very simple change to online comment boards. What we do is next to every comment, we create a space where anyone can come in and restate a point they hear someone else making. That's it. That's the, that's the basic premise. So what you have here is you have active listeners coming in, restating points, uh, it, having different interpretations of what's being said. Other readers can come in and see other interpretations that readers are having of a commenter. So we're creating a space that, uh, a more, a richer commenting space, uh, where you can, yeah, just a richer commenting space. I'll leave that at that. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna run through a, a quick demo here. Uh, let's say that you submit an idea to the Ideas for a Seattle website, and you come back to see what people are commenting about it. So you scroll down and you see Ruth's uh, comment here, and you, you check it out. You can see that other people are restating what they're hearing. When you hover over the bullet point, you can see the text uh, that that point is linked to. So, so you can see different interpretations. 
Uh, I, I, did, I keep on saying interpretations. I'll, I'll leave that out for now. So you scroll down, and you come across a point left by Travis. Now that's me, but you are you now, so think about that. Um, so you uh, hover over this, this point, and you see, you know, Travis just was not saying that. So there's way, we have ways of facilitating community moderation of these, of these uh, bullet points. So you scroll down further, and you come across a comment left by Lisa. And you've seen Lisa around before. She's left a couple ideas. They were pretty good, some comments. But no one's listened to her yet. And you decide, and it's a pretty good point, so you decide to, uh, to restate something that you hear her say. See, 140 characters delimited. Yes, that's a theme. Um, want uh, just a very succinct summaries. Second part of adding a bullet, as you might expect, is linking it to the text that you are summarizing. This provides some level of accountability uh, and, foster, and enables that other uh, interaction that you saw before with hovering. As you can expect, you can you know, edit, delete this stuff. But there's one more important aspect of Reflect that I haven't uh, shown yet, which is I'm going to go in here and log in as myself. Recall that I had left a comment. Now, Reflect privileges speakers or commenters to come back in and to verify whether a summary is accurate or not and potentially leave a clarification. So here, I come down here, and you can see, were you actually saying that? Yes, no, kind of. And I can optionally leave a uh, clarification that will show up underneath the bullet point. OK, so now we've created a space where we have, we have comments, we have restatements of comments, and then clarifications. And hopefully, we're trying to engender a cycle of uh, establishing mutual understanding as opposed to and pushing away from knee-jerk responses. That said, I don't think that you just put this up on Seattle Times comment board and things will like magically work better. There's still garbage in, garbage out. But there are some uh, communities in which this will help tilt the balance towards a more uh, constructive uh, commenting environment. We've deployed Reflect in a, in a few places. I'm going to share a couple of those with you. Our first deployment was with Wikimedia, which is the organization behind Wikipedia and its sister projects. In 2009 and 2010, they conducted a strategic planning initiative where they reached out to their thousands of volunteers across the world in order to gather input about what their strategic direction should be in the next 5, 10, 20 years. And as you can imagine, they got quite a bit of input. So this is one of the pages. Uh, you can see on the, it's really hard to see actually, on the side, that's the full discussion going all the way up. Um, <clears throat> And the, the leaders of this initiative, the facilitators, contacted me to use Reflect uh, to help them summarize the discussion because the, the Reflect bullet points are like comment level summaries, and that can help you move towards creating a full uh, summary of the discussion so that you can understand what the community was uh, uh, describing or conveying that you think they should do. So you can see here on the right side, well, you can't really see now, but it'll stop. Um, the facilitators are using Reflect to summarize the discussion. And they, they, they found that it was useful for um, the summarization task, but they also found that it, it caused them to stop and pause and try to probe deeper into what someone was saying. So they really enjoyed it. Our second deployment was, was a lot of fun. Um, we deployed it on Slashdot. How, ma how, many, how many of you know Slashdot? Yeah, I, I kind of figured that. Last, last talk I gave on this, no one did, or a couple, but this is, this is the crowd for that, right? Um, Slashdot, very popular um, news discussion site for technology. It's probably on the decline a little bit now, but it's, it's, it's still fairly popular. It's, uh, it's not known to be a community of listeners. Uh, <laughs> it's, it has a reputation as being male-dominated. If there was a place where you would not expect empathetic listening to work, it might be Slashdot. Um, so we figured that if, if we could get Slashdotters to empathetically listen to one another, or at least listen, um, we'd be doing pretty well. So we partnered with Slashdot and uh, ran a trial on four stories. So <clears throat> here you can see one of the stories that Reflect was enabled on. And I'm going to do this whole scroll thing again. Um, so you can't read it. Um, and then cherry pick one of the discussions to show you. Um, but they, they used it quite a bit, actually, it turns out. Um, there's over, over one 
summary created per comment on average, um, even for the, one, the comments that are hidden. But just because people are clicking on what do you hear this person saying and typing something in doesn't mean they're typing in a restatement, right? It's an open comment box on the web. You know, you can be putting whatever you want in there. Um, so there's a question of how Slashdot has actually used it. Um, so they could have been, maybe they were actually neutrally re rephrasing what was being said. Maybe they were sarcastically rephrasing what they were hearing. Um, maybe they were just replying to the commenter. Maybe they were adding completely off topic, uh, at, you know, spam basically. All of the above happened. Um, but we actually went in and qualitatively coded the, the bullet points, uh, well, a sample of them, to see what, how they broke down. And what we found was that, surprisingly, nearly 50% of them uh, were actually neutral restatements. So we thought that was, that was actually uh, pretty good. Um, and we also had community moderation of the bullet points. And you can actually see that the moderation was in, the, in favor of hiding those bullet points that were not summaries. And so the, the summaries were actually more visible uh, than these figures may uh, convey. <clears throat> you can see that the antagonizes, the sarcastic and oftentimes hilarious uh, rephrasings of what someone is saying was the second most, uh, uh, most popular one, th which were clear favorites. Um, they're very entertaining. <clears throat> and if you think about it, those kind of antagonizing restatements were actually evidence of listening as well. They're just not neutral. <laughs> uh, <laughs> So, so, both, so we actually had quite a bit of use of it towards the act of listening. Uh, we didn't actually see, we saw far fewer replies and off-topic posts than we thought. Um, and these don't add up to 100% because there are some of them that we just had no idea what, what it meant. <laughs> so, oh, um, one more thing about it. Uh, it was kind of interesting that only 80% of the, of the bullet points that were created were created by people who did not leave a comment in the discussion. So it was primarily created by lurkers in a discussion. Uh, another, uh, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna skip over this a little bit, but we also have uh, done a control experiment on Mechanical Turk where we asked Turkers to come in and talk about their working conditions on Mechanical Turk. Um, and we have one discussion where that has reflect and one that does not. Um, <clears throat> and we actually are seeing, we, asked, we have an, an exit survey uh, where we ask about people's perceptions of other participants in the discussion and how productive this discussion is and that kind of thing. And the self-perceptions or the um, self-report perceptions of the discussion are actually a little bit of negative results. The reflect condition uh, was uh, lower in, in many of the measures. I don't, have the, um, I don't have the questions on here, but it was, it was a bit of negative results. And we're still analyzing it. Um, one of the interesting things is that <clears throat> later participants in the discussion tended to uh, think that the reflect condition was more productive. Uh, you know, potentially that's because as you're scaling up these discussions, having evidence that people are being listened to might make you think that this discussion is going someplace. So we're still, we're still analyzing results here, um, and we're, we're going to try to run some, uh, we're going to try to also use a crowd-based approach to summarizing this discussion and reporting it to uh, Amazon. All right, so uh, this is th these are the projects that we want to share with you. Uh, reflect and consider it. They share uh, some common principles in in affording uh, reflective uh, behaviors. Go for it. Okay, um, so as as I mentioned uh, a couple of times before, there's a a set of norms and values that are informing this work. Uh, one is about uh, communication styles, and we're specifically trying to foster deliberative communication. Um, theorists, though, uh, in uh, communication note that that's not the only model of communication. Uh, our collaborator, Dean Freelon, uh, in his dissertation talked about two other ones. Um, so deliberative is, you know, we're, we're considering trade-offs, we're considering all sides of the issue. Communitarian is where you adhere to a particular party or ideology, band together for mutual support and mutual action, but you're not particularly interested in hearing from the opposition. And then the other model is individualist expression, where you want to just bomb in, uh, say your piece, not necessarily listen or include what other people have to say. Now, 
as I said, we're, uh, privilege, we're specifically trying to uh, support deliberative uh, communication, but we do include some support for the other two. So for the communitarians in the Living Voters Guide, say that you are a strong environmentalist, uh, you can make sure that that point of view is well represented in the points on the different initiatives and work with others to make sure that your point of view is as cogently and powerfully represented. Uh, individualists can also come in and add lots of points and we have a number of those or people that contribute to discussion. We have a civility pledge though that people are asked to check when they create an account in which they say that they won't indulge in uh, personal attacks, uh, creating uh, sock puppets and the like. So we're trying to control the uh, more negative aspects of these other modes of communication. So let's turn to uh, future work uh, for considerate. We want to scale it up. Um, we're hoping to go national. If we can find partners like Seattle City Club and uh, a variety of other states to deploy this in uh, state elections all over the country or at least many other states. We also want to uh, scale it out uh, to other environments. So we had a, some interest in using it in um, uh, civics classes at UW. There's a high school in Bellingham that used it. And I think this is pretty promising as a way of uh, encouraging uh, people, uh, students to deliberate, to consider uh, people with very different points of view in civics education. So uh, this would be a K-12 uh, college uh, environments. Another uh, very interesting application area is within a particular uh, political party movement or ideology, where in the Living Voters Guide, we're trying to span the political spectrum, but you can also do it within uh, a particular movement. Uh, or within a corporation on decision making or external facing, talking to customers uh, and the like. Um, and what we're envisioning is a, a web-based system in which you fill out the information and the measures to be considered, and then it gives you a URL for a custom deployment of considerate. In terms of research, uh, natural language processing, I think, will play a, an important role in the future. So if we've got uh, thousands or tens of thousands of points, not just hundreds, uh, there will be redundancy, and we'd like to use NLP to suggest points that might be merged and then perhaps automatically send email to the people who suggested them and say, uh, negotiate with each other. Maybe you can collapse this into one point or have an improved version. Also, our current relatively flat system of displaying points, I think, uh, needs some additional work when we scale. We want to uh, classify and, uh, or tag points for browsing in particular topic areas uh, that you want to consider. And then finally, we can look for uh, inflammatory speech or the like and, and flag uh, points for moderator review. We haven't had to use that very much so far, but if we scale up, we'll probably see more of it. By the way, so, so we, we actually, uh, in 2010, we, almost had, almost, we had no need for moderation. Uh, we had a few misclassifications, and that was it. This time we had one vandal. Uh, we've had a couple of people who were saying things in a kind of an inflammatory way, but not over the line. Uh, and then we decided on a new strategy, which have volunteer mediators who would come in and say, we're trying to do something different here in terms of fostering a deliberative listening environment. What, what do you think about rephrasing this? And at least in uh, one instance, I got a very nice response to it. Um, another direction for future work is recommender systems. So if this point resonated with you, look at this one as well. And we have tools for that. You know, I, we, we showed you the the ways of drilling down into people that took a position and then what points resonated with them. In this, we really want to be careful, though, not to get the kind of uh, a narrowing. So we want to expose people to a variety of points of view, but we have tools to do that. So remember when we had uh, drilling down into, say, the strong pro people, we had con points that resonated with them. And so we can do the same thing with the recommender system. In addition to looking at individuals, if, you, if this guy is putting points on that you think are particularly coherently stated, you might want to look at some other ones. And then finally, there's a lot of empirical work we'd like to do, uh, both in terms of uh, field deployments, uh, including A-B testing, and lab studies for things like understanding uh, you know, what, what did you get out of this.
So I'm, gonna I'm not going to talk about this much, but we have a number of ideas also about how to move Reflect forward, such as a reputation system for discussion boards that actually incorporates how well you're speaking as well as listening, um, and also trying to build uh, workflows for summarizing full discussions built off of Reflect. But uh, if you want to know more, I have a blog post up about it with some demos, um, but I'm not going to dwell on it here. And so I'd like to thank our collaborators, Lance Bennett from Political Science and Communication, Jonathan Morgan from HCDE, uh, Mike Tuman from CSE, Dean Freelon, Communication, now uh, Assistant Professor at American University, Diane Douglas and Jessica Jones from Seattle City Club, wonderful collaborators, Andrew Humada from Reinspire Me, who helped with uh, some of the implementation and design in the 2010 version, and Sheetal Agarwal, also from Communication. So that's it, and we'd now like to open it up for uh, discussion and questions. So an obvious question is you uh, seem to have purposely steered away from what most of us think elections are about, which are uh, candidates and elected mm -hmm. office. Why? Because I don't think it lends itself as well to the pro-con list. I mean, you can have pros and cons about individuals but it's, it's veering more dangerously toward the you know, personality assessment. Um, I, th I think what I'd like, the way I'd like to approach this is, can you take the same spirit here of reflective listening, uh, deliberation, and apply it in that domain? But it may be a different interface, and I don't know what it is yet. I, I've actually become a little more, I was very skeptical at first about doing it for candidates, and I've become more open to thinking that it might actually work. So I think this is something that we want to try in 2012. I don't think we just want to scale it nationally just at, at, across states, but also try it for the presidential election and see what happens. I mean, the worst case, we, you know, it just doesn't work. So, or maybe I guess we elect someone who is, who is bad if we get really popular, but I don't think that will happen. So. Uh, I'm, I'm uh, oh, sure. Um, I think this is great for uh, these uh, kinds of questions. I was also thinking of uh, something like debates in which, for instance, in a department meeting or a, or a committee meeting or something like that, where you're trying to decide on a policy moving forward or something like that. What, what you often are dealing with is people saying, well, I, I would support this point, but only if this other point is also included in this policy. And I, I, I don't support this because it has one thing in it that I don't like. Is, uh, that's the kind of situation where people resort to like Robert's Rules of Order and all that kind of thing, or they should maybe more often <laughs> resort to Robert's Rules of Order. Have you thought of um, uh, systems that facilitate that kind of debate on the point? We are aware that, that's, that there's all kinds of kind of evolution of a decision that takes place with all kinds of social dynamics. Um, and that is one of the directions that we'd like to move for the general platform is, is supporting kind of that kind of evolution of a decision process. So, you know, another example being in government, when you, when you have initial feedback on some kind of proposed policy and it kind of goes through this cycle, can we actually support an, the evolution of these, of these issues? We haven't gone down to the, the level of, well, what are the actual mechanics of it? I can tell you that this system is not flexible for that right now. Um, so. It's, it's great future work, but uh, we're not sure the boundaries of this system, whether that will push, that that will break the metaphor enough, that, it, that the metaphor is powerful enough to, to work through that. So, so, so a, a pretty interesting use case, though, is the sort of the idea submission system. So like ideas for Seattle that we demoed, uh, there's idea scale local companies deployed that with uh, the Obama administration, FCC, many other places. And they're kind of, again, they seem to privilege speaking. So if you look at uh, Obama's ideas for open government, uh, it posted the most recent submissions. And if you look at the results, the most pressing issue in America at that point was Obama's birth certificate. The second most pressing was marijuana legalization. So it was just, you know, uh, people, and, and it got linked from uh, uh, World Net Daily and just got deluged with people making those points. So uh, we'd like to have, have uh, 
that kind of open submission system, but not let things get drowned out by the, the speaking voices. So for example, uh, people that want to talk about that particular issue, you can have an area in which that's going on, but you don't make the front page uh, be solely diverted, uh, devoted to that. So uh, a related issue is showing government is listening. So uh, the idea submission systems are great as far as they go, but they're kind of unsatisfying in that you put these things in and then it's not clear if anything happens at all. And so one of the things we'd like to do is use Reflect where not uh, the general public, but a government official can reflect back, here's what I hear you saying. So you don't have to have government commit to taking that action or saying, no, I won't do that. That's hard to act on immediately. But you can say, I heard what you said, and here it is to, to show you that I was listening. Thoughts of trying to uh, do this with some of the newspaper reader comment stuff because that stuff is basically junk where a bunch of cranky people uh, mouth off and, and, and but it gives a very negative kind of connotation to the public discourse about a lot of things. <coughs> yes. Well, okay. <laughs> <laughs> and, and we tried it or what? what we we, we have right? explicitly tried it. Um, I've, I've had, a, again, I think that. This challenge of getting deployments, um, working with news organizations, I, I've been trying for multiple years getting, well, I guess that's more like a year and a half, getting Reflect out there in different places. Um, and it's challenging to make those relationships. Um, that said, there have been some cases where we've been able to make some inroads, but not, it hasn't been so much on the, on the, on the news boards. Um, they've, you have to make a business case to them. And the, the comment boards just aren't their business. Um, they've relegated them to, you know, they recognize that they're, that they're kind of trashy and they, they, they hide them and they're kind of like this necessary thing that you have to have. There is excitement. There, is, there are definitely people in the news business who would like to see the commenting experience become uh, uh, more productive. I, I, was, I entered Reflect into a, into a Mozilla uh, Knight Foundation uh, contest or what's the next news experience. And I got very kind of favorable reviews there. Um, but getting people to actually act on it is, 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 a different, is a different case. I think that we need to, I, I don't think you can ha you, that you can maintain that attitude of uh, this is something that we have to have and we're gonna kind of shove it to the bottom of the page and, and expect that if you would put some kind of technology on there that it would actually help things. I think you need to, that the news organizations actually have to put more into it to attract people who actually want to uh, have a productive discussion. W why would you ever comment on one of those boards? Th that, that motivation is, is not necessarily there. But if potentially you could have a, a, a cycle set up where the news organizations actually said, okay, we will Make, write a follow-up story based on the discussion that takes place and have a summary of that, then potentially I can see attracting people who want to have more constructive discussion because there's a natural incentive to doing so. So I think that it really matters how you design the uh, institutional framework in which you have a discussion. And I think that's what news organizations have completely lacked so far. Um. So you can imagine that you need to recurse onto like the reflection, right? Is there is there an intuition why it is that like this two levels of comment is all you need? As I, I, I mean, the, the, the intuition is purely that it's like the 80-20 rule, that you'll get most of the value from the first level. Okay. I mean, that, that would be something appropriate for a lab experiment. Let's, let's, let's try two levels. I mean, you're, you're balancing inter interface complexity. So it's a, when I first had this idea, I'm like, oh, this is simple. <laughs> and like, <laughs> re reading, a, reading a reflect enabled board is a much more complicated experience. Um, you know, do I read the summary first? Do, do I read the, com you know, it's, it's, it's more complicated. You start recursing. I, yeah, but, but there's, the valid question is like, you know, moderation, you're, Reflect's intuition is that moderation isn't enough, really. That like reflecting actually really has more value than moderation. But somehow moderation, moderating the reflex is okay. Yeah, it's just sort of, <coughs> it would be interesting to know the answers to those questions. I mean, uh, yeah, well, of course, moderation has a different power dynamic. So you're saying, I have the power to remove your comment or censor. It's more like the voting up and voting down. 
Oh, okay, okay, the distributed moderation. I, right. I, I would like to move it in a direction of, essentially, we have these sprawling discussions where you have, you know, but we have a linear model for the discussion. So you have all these points that are being made and people aren't, you know, maybe they'll pick up on one of them, and, but then there's this like weird tree structure. Um, I'd like to be able to somehow design an interface, I don't have intuitions on how this would look, where you create, where you have a discussion where people are summarizing a point, and then there's a discussion that is rooted to that single point. That's something similar that you see in the Living Voters Guide, where you have um, discussions that are rooted to a single short point that is being made, in order to kind of have more focused discussions. I don't have any intuitions right now on how to design that for uh, the general reflect board, but that's kind of a direction I'd like to go. Looking even further out from your already ambitious <coughs> plans, it seems like you've really presupposed your systems for a world where free speech is very highly valued and highly protected, and that's uh, a reality that a lot of the world doesn't live in. Uh, any thoughts to how you could operate in a non-American world? No, and that's a great question. Um, so indeed, this, this is you know, both uh, supposing that there's agreement on these deliberative values and that there are underlying rules about free speech that let you say that. Uh, I get, I've, I've had uh, a few discussions with uh, Bacha Friedman about deploying this in her uh, work in Rwanda. She's, she's been taking videos from the International Criminal Tribunal of Rwanda, and then there's bulletin boards and discussions around that. And the, the speech environment is different because there are these genocide uh, ideology laws where, uh, for example, you know, the, the, there are pretty severe restrictions on what speech you can put on there, which means that uh, having a open discussion board uh, runs a considerable risk of having it shut down. So if we do that, we're gonna to have to tackle this question, but I don't know the answer yet. <laughs>